on this week's show, some suggest the Tesla Model X is a lemon, Nissan plays a bit of soccer, and are we really ready for the world of autonomous cars? These stories and more coming up next on 10. Enjoying today's show on YouTube and want to read the stories we're referring to today? Just head to our website at transportevolved.com forward slash TEN, where you'll find today's show notes as well as links to the latest future car news, buying guides, tech primers, and car reviews. It's Friday, May 27th, 2016. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, and I'd just like to announce that thanks to those of you who make a monthly donation to our site via patreon.com, we're in the first stages of moving our office from my dining room into a real office. It's so exciting. We start today's show with the Tesla Model X luxury electric SUV, or rather some of the continuing problems owners of the high-end car are experiencing with their new rides. As regulars to the show will know, Tesla has been fighting an ongoing quality control battle for many months at the Fremont facility where the cars are made, where high-end executives, including Tesla CEO Elon Musk, have been putting in long hours on the shop floor in an attempt to personally quality control as many cars as possible. But even though more and more all Model X reservation holders are finally getting their cars, some owners are now so fed up with their vehicles that they're taking legal action. Take longtime Tesla owner Barrett Lyons, for example. Having owned both Tesla Roadsters and the Tesla Model S, Lyons was as eager as any other fan to get his hands on the Model X. But since owning it, he's suffered a long laundry list of problems, ranging from paint defects through to unexpected door behavior and dangerous autopilot operation. And now, after none of the attempts from Tesla to fix it have worked, he's taking the car company to court in California under the state's Lemon Law, suing the car's full sticker price of $162,000. He's not alone either. Earlier this week, another Tesla Model X owner took her frustration with her car online after the car's trademark fog wing doors failed to operate properly. Feeling like I fell in love with a hot, perfect man and he just gave me herpes, she frustratedly wrote. Yeah, I got nothing. Court cases shouldn't be the only thing worrying Tesla this week either. Attempts to beat it at its own game should be too. That's because this week, German luxury brand Mercedes-Benz, one of the main automakers to lose sales to Tesla in the past few years, has announced its intent to accelerate development of a quartet of new long-range all-electric models. Details at the moment are sparse, but we can say that there won't be like the Mercedes-Benz B-Class ED in production right now. There'll be specially designed brand new models based on the C and S class sedans, as well as the GLA and GLC SUVs, with custom body panels, interiors and badging to differentiate them from their fossil fuel counterparts. Naturally, Tesla is Benz's primary target with these new models, but the reason behind the acceleration of plug-in development isn't down to Model 3 pre-orders. According to sources close to the company, the recent announcement from the German government that it would finally invest in plug-in car initiatives for the first time in its history had also had a major impact on the decision-making process of Benz's parent company, Daimler. Here at Transport Evolved, we've no doubt the company can match and exceed Tesla's build quality and interior design, but we're unsure if it will be able to match its over-the-air software update system, autonomous technology, and charging provision. Let us know in the comments below if you think it can. Mercedes-Benz may have its eyes set on Tesla, but over in Wolfsburg, Germany, troubled automaker Volkswagen is setting its sights on more modest targets. The recently refreshed 2016 Nissan Leaf, an up-and-coming refresh to the BMW i3. As we reported midweek, the automaker has just confirmed that the 2017 Volkswagen e-Golf, a car due to launch this fall, will come with a larger 35.8 kilowatt-hour lithium-ion battery pack, which will give it a real-world range of about 125 miles per charge. That's more than the 107 miles offered by the 30 kilowatt-hour Nissan Leaf, and slightly more than the 121 miles of expected EPA range or expecting of the 2017 i3. We should point out that some outlets are quoting 186 miles being the range of the mildly refreshed e-Golf, a figure which is calculated using the overly optimistic NEDC test cycle. That range is also the figure quoted by Volkswagen sources over the past few months in relation to a new 8th generation Volkswagen e-Golf due to launch sometime in 2019. But since we know that model will be based on the same platform as the Bud E concept car we saw at CES in January, we'll guess that it will have a real-world range closer to around 300 miles per charge. 
Still confused? We've explained it all over at our site with lots of maths, so head over at the end of the show to find out more. Volkswagen isn't the only automaker with plans to expand its plug-in vehicle range this week either. So too is Hyundai, which confirmed midweek that it plans to bring two new longer range models to market in the next four years that will ensure it becomes competitive in the plug-in marketplace. As you might expect, we don't have videos of these cars yet because, well, they haven't been made. But Hyundai, which has previously focused primarily on hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, says it plans to offer a 200-mile electric car by 2018 and a 250-mile electric car by 2020. Given the fact that it hasn't even launched its new 110 mile per charge 2017 Ionic EV yet, and automotive products do tend to stay in the marketplace for at least five years before being replaced, we'd guess that both the 200 and 250 mile models will be brand new, ground up vehicles rather than incremental updates to Ionic, but Hyundai hasn't confirmed one way or the other. What it has confirmed, and we know because we checked, is that the ratings given are calculated on the EPA test cycle. And uh, that's great news for anyone wanting to buy one because EPA test cycles are generally agreed to be the closest cycles to real world driving as we can get. Naturally, we'll keep you posted of the developments to these two models as we get them. But given Hyundai's growing reputation as an automaker and its seven year warranty program, we can't help but think Nissan, Chevrolet and perhaps even Tesla will need to watch their backs in the affordable electric car marketplace should Hyundai make good on its promise very soon. From trying to beat each other in the marketplace to beating each other on the field now, with a time appropriate story involving football next. No, I don't mean American football, which is, let's face it, more like rugby than anything else. I mean a good old fashioned kick a ball about football, or as those in the former colonies like to call it, soccer. Anyway, this weekend it's the UEFA Champions League final in Milan, where Real Madrid and Atletico will duke it out on pitch in an all Spanish showdown. Why are we covering football on Transport Evolved? Well, while we're sure some of you are fans of the sport, it's because Japanese automaker Nissan, as official UEFA Champions League sponsors, will be sending an entire fleet of Nissan ENV200 electric minivans and Nissan Leaf electric cars to Milan to be used as official transportation for the event. In total, more than 100 electric cars will be used to shuttle dignitaries and special guests to the match, as well as perhaps encouraging sports fans to dump the pump and go electric in the process. Will it encourage those multi-million dollar sports stars out of their Lamborghinis and Ferraris? Well. That's a completely different question, but it is one I'm eager to find the answer to. Shifting gears now, we're getting particularly nerdy next with the news that the Society of Automotive Engineers, or SAE for short, has released a new set of guidelines determining best practices for the wireless inductive charging of electric vehicles. The standards, quietly released last week, should make it easier for electric car manufacturers to both design and implement wireless charging systems for their cars. Although, as we've acknowledged here before, many in the industry believe a push to wireless charging is well, a little premature when electric cars still have such a small market share. The latest agreed upon standard, catchily known as TIRJ2954, lays out a common wireless charging frequency of 85 kilohertz that SAE says should be used to charge light duty vehicles, that's cars and small pickups to you and I, at power from three kilowatts all the way up to 22 kilowatts. As always, there's room for interpretation in the standards, but it does make a future where you never have to plug in a more achievable reality. Do we need it? Well, that's a different question, and it's one we're trying to answer ourselves thanks to a six-month trial of the Pugless Power wireless charging system on our Nissan Leaf. Head to our site to find out how we're getting on and if we think it's a good idea after just six weeks. We've only had one Tesla story thus far this week, and so we're guessing you were expecting at least another one. So here you go. Except this time we're talking about Tesla the automaker, not the cars themselves. That's because this week we've seen increasing pressure applied to Tesla from the Union of Automotive Workers, or UAW for short, the trade organization which represents hundreds of thousands of automotive industry assembly staff at factories all across the US. It wants Tesla, the only US automaker to not have a UAW United workforce yet, to allow it to set up representation within the factory, essentially becoming the workforce's representatives when it comes to negotiating pay, conditions, bonuses, and perks. As you might expect, the call isn't exactly new. The UAW has been trying to unionize the Tesla workforce since the Tesla Model S began production in Fremont in 2012. But while the UAW wants to bring representation to Tesla's workforce, 
alongside collective bargaining rights. Tesla's responded thus far by saying that changing the world isn't a nine to five job. Things right now seem at an impasse, but if they change, we'll let you know. From Fremont, California now to London, England via China, or rather Coventry via China and London, or look, somewhere in the vicinity of the Greenwich Meridian. Why? Well, we're off to the London Taxi Company, which is preparing itself to develop and build the TX5, its first ever plug-in hybrid taxi. And in order to raise the money to do that, parent company Geely, a Chinese firm which also happens to own Volvo cars, has announced its intent to raise bonds worth £276 million, £400 million, to make that happen. It's all part of a plan to ensure that as a manufacturer of London's iconic taxi cab, a design that really hasn't changed much in the last 30 or 40 years or so, the company is ready to comply with regulations coming into force that will ensure all taxis in operation in London streets be zero emission capable by 2020, starting in 2018. What's more, the company's Fraser Nash and Ecotiv Limited, London taxi company's biggest rival, already have a plug-in hybrid vehicle that's being tested on the streets of the nation's capital right now. It's remarkably similar in design and has actually already been the subject of a court case in which Geely tried and failed to sue for trademark infringement. Either way, those zero emission cabs do need to start hitting the streets in just two years time as those new regulations start to slowly roll in. So both companies had better, well, to put it bluntly, hurry on up. Would you feel comfortable behind the wheel of an autonomous car? Or more importantly, would you trust your life to one if it didn't have any traditional steering wheel or controls in it? These are the types of questions that were asked in a recent study conducted by researchers at the University of Michigan's Sustainable Worldwide Transportation Department. And as we told you this week, the answers indicate that while autonomous drive technology is nearly ready for mass adoption, car buyers clearly aren't. The study, conducted at the start of the month, follows previous identical studies carried out in the past few years and suggests that despite more publicity surrounding autonomous vehicles, not to mention the rollout of Tesla's autopilot system, the average car buyer either doesn't understand autonomous vehicle technology or doesn't trust it. The study is bad news for pretty much every automaker rushing to bring autonomous vehicle technology to market, and even worse, bad news for Google, whose end goal is to produce car-like pods with no steering wheel or controls that just drive themselves. Like electric car mass adoption, however, we're guessing that attitudes will gradually change over the coming years with the right education, but it's going to be an uphill struggle. And despite advantages of having fully autonomous cars on the road, don't expect them to be commonplace anytime soon. Sorry. Which brings us to our final story, and perhaps one which unfortunately illustrates that autonomous vehicles aren't quite ready for prime time anyway, or rather, we aren't ready for them. As those who frequent the site might remember, we've featured several stories over the past few weeks involving Tesla Model S and Model X cars, which have misbehaved when being driven with autopilot engaged. Usually, the fault can be traced to human error rather than machine problems, but this week a video popped up online showing a Tesla Model S slamming into the back of a stationary van parked in a fast lane, obviously broken down, of a road with its hazard lights blinking. Now, before I get hate mail, I should note here that since we first noticed the video, it has been pulled down offline. And regardless of the reason, either legal or otherwise, for the video being removed, it's worth noting that we do need to have a discussion here about autonomous vehicles, and specifically autopilot, because we're seeing an increase in reports on people claiming that autopilot has either caused an accident or not worked as it should have done. I should point out here too, for balance, that there are equally as many videos showing autopilot preventing crashes or keeping occupants safe in some pretty terrifying situations. So this isn't a clear-cut Tesla bad or Tesla good situation. But what is clear, and I'm not going to put my ranting hat on, is that as the previous story demonstrated, there's still a general lack of understanding about how autonomous systems work, which may sometimes mean that people are either not paying attention or not setting the system properly. And while Tesla does warn customers that autopilot is a beta feature and should be used as such, Indemnity from fault does not equal appropriate training. Which brings me to the question I want you to all answer before next week's show. Should we have to pass a test before we can drive a car with autonomous drive features? After all, pilots flying planes have to take different tests depending on if they're flying by sight, visual sight rules, or with the age of advanced instrumentation and flight aids, instrument flying. Shouldn't the same be true of cars and autopilot to minimize human error? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. 
I'm looking forward to the discussion. And on that note, I think we're done for today. Another 10 stories and another long show and lots of errors in the process, but I hope you all liked it. If you did, give us a thumbs up and share. And if you didn't, give us a thumbs down and tell us why you didn't like it. I'll be back next week at the usual time with another episode of TEN. But in the meantime, you can find all the news that's fit to print at our website at transportevolve.com. Catch up with us on Twitter at Transport Evolve or check out our latest shows on our usual YouTube channel. And if you liked what you saw today, please consider keeping us independent and impartial by supporting our Patreon crowdfunding campaign over at patreon.com forward slash Transport Evolved. As I said at the top of the show, we've just found a truly awesome office space and we'd like to rent it as an official Transport Evolved studio, complete with really fast internet. So any help you can offer is the difference between being able to afford it or not being able to afford it. And if we're going to grow, we need to get out of my dining room, honestly. As always, there are lots of stories you didn't manage to fit into today's show, including a long list of things you'll have to agree to in order to become an official Tesla owners club. Ontario charges up its green car advocacy with a slew of new electric car initiatives. Another Toyota RAV4 EV joins the Transport Evolved fleet courtesy of the Walton Elliots. Nothing to do with me. And a guy who may or may not have been asleep behind the wheel of his autopilot engaged Model S and the reason that last story exists. So when we're done, be sure to head to our site to read them all. Thanks for watching. I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. Have a fantastic weekend. And until next time, keep evolving.